One day, as St. Francis of Sales descended from the altar, he was met with a woman requesting his blessing for her children. The kind bishop embraced each one, but upon reaching the youngest, his mother described him as an unruly, headstrong boy on whom correction was thrown away. St. Francis responded, Well, well, we must not be hard upon young people. High spirits are not a sin. And now, take comfort for what I say. For I tell you that God has chosen this good child to promote his glory and to do a great service in the church. The saint spoke the truth. Nearly 200 years later, Father Faber would say of this young boy, Of all the uncanonized servants of God, whose lives I have read, he most resembles a canonized saint. After his death, many would find healing by the touch of his cassock. Even St. Vincent de Paul would ask God for great graces through his intercession. While we still must wait for this man's canonization, it is worthwhile nonetheless to examine the edifying and pious life of Abbe Jean-Jacques Ollier. As hinted by his mother, this child was a rambunctious boy whose pastime was nearly getting himself killed. On one occasion, after making the sign of the cross and saying a prayer to his overworked guardian angel, he was seen leaping from his third-story bedroom onto the roof of the higher building next door. He was trying to catch a bird. While a rascal, he was not without piety. He grew up with the tender love of his heavenly mother. Whenever he would receive a new pair of clothes, he would race down to the cathedral, presenting his garments before his lady, begging for the grace to never sin while wearing it. Still, despite his hyper-behavior, Olier's parents destined him to the priesthood. He would receive tonsure when he was only eight years old. But unfortunately, in 17th century France, the priesthood had become nothing but a vehicle for worldly ambition. While there were countless priests, not even a handful of these were devout. Even St. Vincent de Paul would speak of them saying, the church has no worse enemies than her priests. These men, unworthy of their office, surrendered themselves to ambition, doing anything they could to obtain a high rank in the church or state. Others, on the other hand, sought to gratify their senses. The rest sought to prove their intelligence through their vain learning and their empty sermons. Sadly, Jean-Jacques' parents were not free of these worldly motives in securing their son's vocation. Due to his exceptional brilliance upon entering his studies, Olier quickly won many honors and distinctions. At the age of 18, he was given a benefice, receiving a monthly sum from the monastery of Prabac. Still unordained, he now donned the title Abbe and was given faculties to preach. Unfortunately, being surrounded by new temptations and the acclaim of the world, he abandoned the piety of his youth and threw himself into the sin of ambition. Yes, Abbe Olier became the prime example of the 17th century cleric. He was a vain man whom nearly all the world adored, except for one woman, Marie Rousseau, a holy and pious widow who frequented the heights of contemplation all while running an inn. The object of her prayer would be that sorry state that had befallen the priesthood. Upon seeing the abbe and his friends walk in, having come from a worldly and impious festival, she reprimanded them at once. Ah, sirs, I have long prayed for your conversion, and I hope God will even yet hear my prayer. These words would prick the conscience of Olier, and he would never again feel at peace amid the pleasures of the world. For 18 months, he was conflicted. He would write of this period, saying, I did not love the world. I could not find any satisfaction in it. Yet, I was forever falling, despite the sweet attractions of God's love his unceasing solicitations, and the remorse I was sure to suffer after sinning. Still, unable to sacrifice his pride, he headed to Rome, intending to obtain a master's degree in Hebrew, all to win the acclaim of others. But just as pride blinds the heart, it was a fitting punishment that along the way, Olier would start to go blind. He was, became filled with fear and sorrow. And not knowing what to do, he decided to turn to the Mother of God. In pilgrimage, he set forth to the Holy House of Laredo to request Our Lady's assistance. Later, he would write that as he neared that sacred place, his heart was wounded as it were with an arrow 
and all inflamed with the holy love of Mary. Upon entering the church, he fell to his knees, now sobbing before the Queen of Heaven. Jean-Jacques Solier was converted and was healed at once. Leaving his self-love behind, he returned to France with the love of Christ and his poor. He gathered them in the streets, preaching to them and even kissing their open wounds. He abandoned all additional studies and would soon be ordained, devoting himself to the countryside missions. During these, his charity would be described as never tiring, however exhausted he might have been. If he met a poor man along the way, he would stop and speak to him of God. Not only due to his intellect, but surely due to grace, these missions were a vast success. Catholics were inspired with the love of God, and heretics were converted. On one occasion, peasants, coming from a great distance, filled the church and even the courtyard. Men and women were even seen hanging from the windows, listening to the sermons with great fervor. One contemporary relates that upon entering the confessional, the poorest and most wretched came to cast themselves into Olier's arms, as into a secure harbor of charity. Not content with these, he also sought the lost sheep. No journey would be too burdensome to prevent him from reaching those who could not or would not attend the mission. Upon arriving at some poor family shack, he would feed them, dress their wounds, and even wash their clothes. There was nothing that he would not do to win their hearts. And after leaving, he would soon return, instructing the household in the truths of salvation. A reputation for holiness and zeal quickly spread. The Bishop of Paris soon wrote to King Louis XIII, asking that he be made bishop and undertake the reformation of the clergy. He wrote, In recommending Olier, I feel that I am proposing the man, who of all others, is most fitted to fill this important see. And I assure your majesty that in the whole kingdom, I know no one who, by his intelligence, piety, and prudence, is more capable of doing honor to the episcopate. The abbe humbly refused the position. He would respond, speaking of his inadequacy, stating that he simply asked our Lord to remain of the number of his least and lowest servants in the holy work of missions. One day, when reflecting upon the state of his soul, Olier realized that it seemed as if he could do nothing without self-love. The abbe, having made much progress, even more than most, was, was still missing something. He longed to be united with Christ, and longed for that day when he could finally say, God alone. This burning desire for perfection was the source of his frequent prayer. O oh, life divine, when shall I live only of God? During a retreat with this in mind, he made two requests. One, for spiritual trials that would purify him, and two, that his reputation for sanctity would be taken away. Our Lord, in his tender love for souls seeking perfection, graciously granted him his request. Soon, one biographer relates, God would raise him to a still higher degree of sanctity. He would empty him entirely of self and form within him the life of his dear son. And to this end, he subjected him to the humiliations most painful to pride and self-love. In Olier's dark night, he would be deprived of his faculties. His body would often ignore the movements of his will refusing to obey his commands. His memory and intellect often failed him completely, resulting in an inability for conversation and writing. His friends even abandoned him, presuming that he'd become depressed after refusing the bishopric. It appeared that God had even forsaken him too. He would state that he was always sensibly empty of God, filled with sentiments of pride and self-love. He wrote that these feelings which everywhere pursued him were perpetual crucifixion. The abbe now saw the deep poverty of man and the immense grandeur of God. But let us not think that his cross came from the state that he had been reduced to. Rather, having seen his great nothingness, he could not understand how a creature like himself could ever glorify God. Olier's triumph came during the octave of Corpus Christi. Sitting in prayer at Notre Dame, when the bells began to ring out marking the solemnity, it is reported that his mind, as by a sudden and divine illumination, apprehended the immense glory which God receives during that great festival. His soul was transported with joy. Olier then realized that his heart too shared in this universal homage, that it too rendered praise and glory to God. Olier's dark night would come to a close. 
And now, empty of self and full of Christ, he would be prepared for two great and lasting works. Olier would be called from the missions to undertake the reform of the clergy and the reform of the parish of St. Sulpice. One writes of this parish, stating, It was a very sink of iniquity, and of every abomination possible to imagine. This modern Sodom was the abode of libertines, atheists, and heretics, who there were free to indulge their worst passions with impunity. At the doors of this parish, parishioners could even buy books instructing the reader on the practice of witchcraft. At the height of dueling, 17 men were fatally wounded in a single week. There was even a bar in the vaults of the church where priests, after Mass, would go to receive the so-called confession fee. Everywhere the abbe turned, there was disorder. First, he reformed his priests and, in a word, made them useful. He sent them through the streets of Paris, ringing bells signifying the approaching catechism class. Thousands of children would soon follow them to the great edification of all. Like many good priests of our day, Olier also fought valiantly for the modesty so becoming of Christians. With discretion, he would quietly correct the indecent. But in cases of scandal, he was never afraid to act immediately. Even on one occasion, he sent a pin to a servant of the queen requesting that she fasten her scarf. Not content to save souls, but longing to sanctify them, he preached that Christian perfection belonged to all. And perhaps the most notable reform was his promotion of devotion to the Blessed Sacrament. Twice a month, he held solemn benediction with exposition and even a procession. But to not make commonplace the majesty of the Holy Eucharist, he refused a large sum of money that someone offered if he were to make this practice more frequent. One historian relates the results of our abbe. It was by particular dispensation of his providence that God raised up Olier and his zealous fellow laborers, who, burning with the desire of promoting his glory, broke up this ungrateful soil. By the unwearied labors of these evangelical husbandmen, it became a very land of promise, where each taught his neighbor to know and glorify God. It was easy to note the change that had taken place by the frequent confessions, the numerous restitutions, the submission shown to the laws of the church, the earnestness displayed in attending the divine offices, the hungering after the word of God, and the contrition and penitence of a multitude of prodigals. This reform even made the neighborhood villains pious. If they realized that the man they were about to rob was a priest, they would cease at once and escort him home. They were afraid that without their help, the priest may fall into the hands of bandits who might be less holy than themselves. All while acting as pastor over 400,000 souls, Olier would be engaged in his true vocation, the sanctification of the clergy. A hundred years earlier, the Council of Trent had called for the erection of seminaries for this purpose. But where were they? Since Trent, all six French provincial councils had demanded their creation. Even St. Francis de Sales would state, I am thoroughly convinced that there is nothing more necessary in the church than the creation of these seminaries. But many holy prelates had tried and all had failed. Even St. Francis de Sales would lament that he was only able to find three priests willing to assist him in the reform of the clergy just for his diocese. It was to this purpose that God raised up Jean-Jacques Ollier. And since his conversion, God was preparing him to erect the first successful and enduring seminary in France. To this end, he founded the Society of St. Sulpice, whose sole endeavor was to form holy priests. But what made Ollier successful? He, with other holy men, including St. Vincent, arrived at the solution. The seminary of St. Sulpice would be founded upon piety. The first and last end of this institute, Ollier would write, is to live solely for God, in Christ Jesus our Lord, in such a way that the interior dispositions of God the Son penetrate deeply into our hearts, until each one can save himself what St. Paul wrote, I live, now not I, but Christ liveth in me. In a word, the object of the seminary was to reproduce the interior life of Christ and the hearts of the seminarians. They would take him as their model, studying and meditating upon his virtues, praying that they may be filled with his dispositions, such as his sentiments of piety towards his father, of charity towards men, self-annihilation, and horror of the world and sin.
To reproduce this interior life in the hearts of the seminarian, one writes, was Olier's one unceasing object. The abbe would thus say, Then only are men worthy of these most august titles. When it can be affirmed of them, it is thus Jesus Christ spoke, it is thus Jesus Christ acted, it is thus Jesus Christ suffered. In order to empty his seminarians of self and fill them with the spirit of Christ, Jean-Jacques would only choose the greatest means. He would write that Jesus Christ, who promised to live in holy souls, communicated his life to no one with such plentitude as to his holy mother. Elsewhere writing, There he dwells in all his fullness, being but one heart, one soul, one life with her. From these principles, Olier would conclude that Mary is as a sacrament by which our Lord distributes his blessings and his graces, and it is to this abundant source that the clergy must resort in order to imbibe the life of Jesus Christ. Olier continues, St. John beheld all of this. He represents the Most Holy Virgin as a woman clothed with the sun, having on her head a crown of twelve stars, emblem of the apostles, teaching us thereby that holy filled and penetrated with Jesus Christ, figured by the sun, she fills in her turn all the apostles in the church and gives them all that they have of light and splendor. Thus, devotion to the life of Jesus living in the heart of Mary, the perfect Christian, would be Olier's means of producing the spirit of our Lord in his seminarians. It's no surprise that St. Louis de Montfort attended this seminary. The success of St. Sulpice proved problematic. It quickly outgrew its limited space. Lacking funds, but not confidence, Olier turned to that Blessed Virgin. One day, while in ecstasy, she appeared to him holding a model of the building, which was said to be much greater in extent than any which he had contemplated, and perfectly adapted to his purpose. Of course, she provided the means to build it. Rejecting the title of founder, Olier would say it is Jesus and his Holy Mother who is the founder and the owner of this house. One biographer writes that everywhere about the house might be seen the monogram of Mary, not only on every door and window, but on all the furniture, ironwork, and linen. On the success of this seminary, one writes, Within 10 or 12 years of the establishment, Olier was able to state in a letter to the sovereign pontiff that it had already given many dignitaries, including bishops, to the realm. And from that time forward, almost all the seas of France were filled by ecclesiastics who had been trained at the seminary of saint sulpice Uninvited and unannounced from all quarters of the inhabitable globe drawn here, wholly for the sake of perfecting themselves, the seminary be became a model for France. And soon, countless bishops would request the Sulpicians to help them establish seminaries in their own diocese. Even the island of Montreal would soon belong to the Sulpicians. When confronted with success, Olier would state that his greatest joy was when the works of his community were attributed to God alone. He wrote, I rejoice the more in perceiving that all of this is done in our little community, that nothing is ascribed to any of us, but God alone is acknowledged as doing all things here. He never wanted to take credit for anything. He believed that God alone deserved to be in the minds of men, and for him to put himself there would be nothing short of robbery. Upon receiving requests for an important work, Olier, feeling as though society was unworthy, would frequently refer them to St. Vincent de Paul's congregation. On the other hand, when asked, St. Vincent would refer them to Olier's congregation. This humility of our abbe is perhaps one of the most striking elements of his life. He saw himself as nothing, recognizing that all good came from God. He noticed that his sin was the only thing that he could really claim to be the author of. Like St. Augustine, he was grateful to God not only for his forgiveness, but also from preventing him from the multitude of sins that he did not commit. Even in great graces, Olier would find there a cause for humility. On one of these occasions, Jean-Jacques was standing over a young girl who had died. But at once, he felt something spring forth from his interior and fall upon the child, who immediately was raised to life. Speaking of this incident, the abbe said, I knew not what this influence was, unless it proceeded from Jesus Christ dwelling in me. It came purely from him. It makes me see what little share the ministers of Christ have in the operations of his goodness 
and power. Unfortunately, death would come for the abbe rather early. At the age of 44, Ollier fell to the ground paralyzed. His last few years would be spent in illness and infirmity. For some time, he would even be unable to say or even attend Mass, but he would not lose his happy state. He was grateful to be doing the will of God, writing that the devil, not infrequently, makes us long for a return of health in order that we may labor in the cause of God. When God simply desires to be glorified by our infirmities and sufferings. With this in mind, the abbe would bear sickness so well that in one of his most painful infirmities, he was seen in a state of serenity, quietly saying, love, love, love. One author testifies that he spoke these words with such sweetness and devotion that bystanders would be moved to compunction and retired, resolving to lead a more holy life. On March 31st, 1657, Ollier spoke his last words. A man began began to praise the abbe, but with a keen sense of his own nothingness, Jean-Jacques sadly responded, Ah, what you say pierces me to the heart. He received the last sacraments, and on Easter Monday, with St. Vincent de Paul at his side, he passed away. A witness testified that he retained his senses to the last, and that the loving transports of his soul never cease till they found their perfect fruition in the bosom of God. Comforting the Sulpicians, St. Vincent wrote, His body has been consigned to the earth. Heaven has received his soul. His spirit is still yours, and if God has judged him worthy of a place in paradise with his angels, you ought not deem him unworthy of a place in your hearts. These two men became the fathers of the French clergy, who would in turn be called the wonder of the second half of the 17th century, and said to have traversed the wretched and impure 18 with little loss. The revolution of this 18th century would be confounded by the spiritual sons of Ollier and the company of men that surrounded him. Many of these priests gladly offered their blood in holy martyrdom. Others became confessors, saving souls in the midst of terror. Some were exiled, but returned with open arms, bringing the prodigal children back home. These living images of Christ were said to have won the reputation of being the holiest, the purest, and the grandest of any clergy. Ollier and the reformers of the 17th century paved the way for this great clergy by reestablishing the oft-forgotten principle that the saints are simply those who resemble the admirable Son of God living in the Blessed Virgin Mary the most. In the life of Ollier, we see the great mercy of God. He took a vain and conceited cleric, ever on the road to hell, and turned him into the opposite, making him the father to countless holy priests. The example and teaching of Ollier thus reminds us that we should rejoice in our nothingness. Because of our nothingness, Christ living and dwelling in us alone is glorified. But despite our nothingness, he would still unite himself to us, becoming the principle of our life, creating in us a resounding echo of the same Jesus Christ, and bringing us to heaven, where we will forever rejoice in the great love of God. Thank you, Jean-Jacques Ollier.